There is a new Porsche Cayman GT4, goody gumdrops, this is it. And it's the latest in an illustrious line of GT Porsches, among which I think probably my favourite is this 911 GT3 RS, which we'll come to in a moment, because there is also the most extreme, or certainly the fastest GT Porsche, which is the very recent GT2 RS. And what I'd like to do today is A, test the GT4, but also test these other two as well, to see if there is some kind of lineage, some kind of bond that links all of these GT Porsches. So welcome to the inside of the GT2 RS, which is where we'll start this little back-to-back -back test, this little Autocar Heroes, really. It's one of our series of Heroes videos. We did a really good McLaren one recently, but we do them alongside other news, reviews, road tests, track tests, off-road tests, drag races. But if you like, subscribe, turn on post notifications, you won't miss them, and I recommend you do. And I want to start in the GT2 RS because it kind of bookends at the very top of things. Porsche's GT range, which is 20 years old this year. The very first GT3 came about because Porsche needed to homologate, I think, one suspension component, maybe one wishbone for the 911s it wanted to go racing with. So it created the GT3 model to do it. We've got GTs 2, 3 and 4 here today. Now there was a GT1, but it was built and named for a GT1 race category in the 1990s and was then fairly crudely homologated as a road car. Although Watercar did, interestingly, road test it. But anyway, we don't have one of these. We've got the sensible, inverted commas sensible, GTs 2, 3 and 4. GT2 RS has never really been considered a sensible car. Oh, no! generation 911 the 991 went off sale not very long ago and the 2 is the biggest baddest most absurd 911 there has arguably ever been the gt2 rs comes with a carbon bonnet titanium cage in the back rose jointed suspension and normally a magnesium roof but this car has the visarc package which means it comes with a carbon fiber roof carbon fiber anti-roll bars and magnesium wheels that shave another 30 kilograms from the weight leaving it on our scales 1,520 kilograms when full of fuel. The 991 GT2 RS is PDK only and has carbon ceramic brakes as standard. Now, if you were to take it crudely, you would say, well, it's a Turbo S motor with the wick turned up in the back of a GT3 RS chassis. So it's got the most powerful engine in the raciest chassis, if you like. Now, there's a bit more to it than that because Porsche is Porsche and it does not do things by halves. It always finally owns things to the nth degree. But the short of it is that this is the most monstrous engine in the most focused chassis, which means it's a turbocharged 3.8 litre flat six cylinder engine behind the rear axle, and it makes 700 PS, 691 brake horsepower, 700 metric horsepower. And the whole car weighs about 1500 kilos. So it drives through a seven-speed twin-clutch gearbox. And when I first drove this car, I had one brief go at it before. We did a video on it and promised that we'd return to it. So here we are returning to it. And I was a bit intimidated by it. However, I've been driving it a little bit this morning and I've got to say, I am absolutely 100% smitten with it. It's just unbelievably fabulous. It's much less intimidating than I thought it was at first. You can really just play with it in a way that you would not necessarily think is sensible for a car that has 700 horsepower and the engine out the back. And that's the tremendous success of Porsche these days, is that they have made the 911 the greatest sports car lineage of all time with a layout that, if you were designing a car from scratch today, I do not think you would use. The rear engine is great for packaging, which is why the VW Beetle and Porsche's earliest designs had it. But take that GT2 we weighed, 63% of the weight is over the back wheels. 
Racing cars and most supercars have their engines as near the middle as possible, either behind the seats or pushed back under the bonnet, which reduces inertia and makes the car easier and more willing to turn and gives it a more even weight distribution. The 911 gets its unique character, its brilliant character, both because of and despite the engine location. And it's still ultimately incredibly rewarding and yet far more approachable than it should ever need to be. I absolutely adore this car. I think it's just really brilliant. The steering's really quick, but there's loads of road feel through it, even though it's electrically assisted. Body control is fantastic. The ride is okay, even though it's on 21 inch wheels at the back with three 25 section tires. So it's over a foot wide at the back, but there's so much torque and there's so much of that you could just break traction on those cars, those wheels all the time. And it's just absurd that you can play with the chassis of a car with this layout and this much power in as docile a fashion as it is. But let's go and try one of the others in this GT series. Try my favorite of all GT cars, although this is actually giving me, giving it a run for its money right now, which is the 997 series GT3 RS. Right, so this is it. This is what has been my favourite of the GT Porsches to date, sort of. I mean, it's the one where people started to make things rather complicated to go, oh, right, was that the 99? Is that the 997.2 GT3 RS, which is 3.8, rather than 0.1, which is, of course, the 3.6. And then, of course, there was the GT3 RS 4-litre, which is the one you can't get and now costs half a million pounds, etc., etc. The short of it is, this was always the GT3 RS, the GT Porsche, that spoke to me the most. However, having just got in it from the 2 RS, which has blown me away with how approachable it is, how easy it is and yet how involving and engaging it is, instantly this car, which once upon a time I thought well nothing will ever get close to a car like this in terms of its intimacy and its involvement and its precision, well it feels old and not slack, just that somehow visibility is, is better and the steering is that much slower, it's another half turn between locks on the steering, so it feels slightly less precise than the 2 RS. And it's only got 30,000 miles on it. I don't, you know, they will be hard miles. But it's not like this is an, an old classic car where things have started to fatigue. It's still as tight as it was. There's a cage in the back, don't forget, keeping the body tight. That's where the difference lies, is that modern cars, in disguising their weight and with their lighter steering, just feel more arcadey and more computer gamey. So in terms of throwing them round and drifting them, especially as they've got so much more power and more torque, they become more playable, more like a real version of Gran Turismo. Whereas cars like the GT3 RS of this ilk feel that little bit more real somehow. So on this 997 GT3 RS, there is a plexiglass rear screen, carbon fiber rear wing and titanium exhausts that sound absolutely terrific. <laughs> This car has had its air conditioning and radio removed to be the lightest it can be and of course it gets a manual gearbox. So I have to change gears myself and when I do you get that engine, the mother of all engines. So it's got a 3.8 litre, there were 3.6 versions earlier and a 4 litre version later. Flat 6 making only, only. 450 metric horsepower. It's that 444 brake. And it revs to eight and a half. And it makes the power all the way around there. And it is such a razor sharp, brilliantly responsive engine. What's known as the Metzger flat six engine in this and other pre-991 series GT3s has its roots in the 911 GT1 we mentioned earlier. This dry sump unit was first designed as a race engine and here it's been developed out to 3.8 litres which was just before it reached its zenith in the GT3 RS 4 litre. The astonishing thing is the way it revs and the key thing is that it's naturally aspirated. What an engine it is and what a noise it makes. The throttle 
response is just off the scale. But to match the downshifts, you know, it's just down to it's just down to you doing it. The PDK isn't doing it. You just do the downshifts yourself. So yeah, in this car you're going slower than you are in a GT2 RS. But I don't think you're having any less fun. And you're spending that time, extra time you've got, doing more stuff, more involved in the process. But what is interesting about the difference between GT3 and GT2, I used to think that a turbocharged engine would make a car more difficult to play with near its limit because the engine took longer to spool up and then also it would keep hanging when the rear wheels were spinning if you backed off. But actually what I have found is that a turbo engine I think probably makes cars even more playable for that reason. So you accelerate, you get the big slug of torque that spins up the back tyres, and that can send a car sideways, and then actually when you lift off, because the engine hangs ever so slightly, and that torque keeps the rear wheels spinning, they come back to spinning at road speed and grip is retained and regained, actually more easily sometimes than in a naturally aspirated car, where the power is switched on very quickly, but there's not necessarily loads of torque to back it up, and then as you lift off, the rear wheels could come back down to road speed and regain their grip quite briskly, which could mean that they're actually harder to play with on the limit, which is not what I expected when there first came this glut of turbocharged engines. So I think actually a GT2 RS is more playful at the limit than a GT3 RS, despite the fact it's got 700 horsepower, 325 section back tyres. I think it's an easy car to mess around with However, don't let that take away anything from this car because in its lightness and actually once you just get used to the fact that the steering is a little bit slower, and the engine is that much sharper, it just becomes a real rewarding, less digital, more analog precision tool. And I like that. I was blown away by that GT2 RS. I thought, yeah, that is, this is an astonishingly good car, a much better car than I first thought when I drove it very briefly in the wet. But the more you get into this, I think the more you get out of it. Three or four weeks ago, I said that the McLaren F1 was the greatest car I'd ever driven, the best car I'd ever driven, and it is. But this is still comfortably in my top five ever. It's just that good. It's so brilliant. It epitomises for me everything that GT Porsches are about. So anyway, enough of this. All right, so welcome to the four, the GT4. We've done two, we've done three, we've done four. Now you may notice there are two letters missing in the four, and they are R and S. They are not insignificant, because the Cayman has not had an RS version. In fact, there was a long time when Porsche would not give the Cayman any more power than an equivalent 911. Well, now it has. It did so with the last GT4, and it has allowed this one, 420 metric, 414 brake, from a 4-litre flat 6. So the 718 Cayman has only had a 4-cylinder turbo to date, but as the GT department boss says, do we really look like the 4-cylinder guys? Now the engine is not the same generation as the GT2 RS's with the turbos taken off and neither is it a development of any old naturally aspirated engine. This is basically the new family of Porsche flat six engines which we'll find in the 992. It lives alongside other Porsche six cylinders and this is an engine that can be fitted to all kinds of things in large quantities for a long time to come. It revs to 8,000 RPM, it gets two petrol particulate filters, it can run on three cylinders, it is a clean, modern, efficient flat six engine. And it is... coarse would be the wrong word, but it is certainly not as smooth as the six cylinders in either of the 911s we've got here. But hey, it is a Cayman with six cylinders at least and it feels strong, it's got a lot of torque, and it revs to 8,000. It is a much better engine than the previous Cayman GT4, but I'm not sure it is quite as smooth as that car's was, and it's certainly not as smooth as the two 911s. So what's new about the Cayman GT4? 
Suspension at the front is taken wholesale from the GT3. The rear dampers are inverted and the control arms and subframe are pure GT3 too. Outside there is a beastly rear wing making 20% more downforce than the last GT4s and a diffuser carried over from the GT4 Club Sport race car and a front splitter like the GT3s means the latest GT4 makes 50% more downforce than the previous car but no more drag. But what are the chassis? Well, this car feels broad compared to a 3RS, it feels a similar sort of size and in fact in width they are and in terms of its weight it is too. I mean this is pushing 1500 kilograms so not as heavy as the GT2 RS but heavier than that 997. And what I always thought about the Cayman and one of the reasons Porsche declined to give it so much power for a long time is that the engine being in the middle is just the optimum place for a sports car. I mean, it's why race cars are mid-engined. If you put the mass close to the middle, well, that reduces the moment of inertia. That makes a car more agile. It evens up the weight distribution front and back. Theoretically, you should have a better, or at least faster, sports car if you put the engine in the middle. I mean, not right in the middle, it's right behind it. And in many ways, the Cayman's engine location absolutely works in its favour. It's got a really lovely front rear balance. And the old Cayman GT4 was one of the most rewarding mid-engine cars I have ever driven. This car never feels soggy or heavy, but when you've got two RS models alongside it, it does feel that bit softer, that bit more everyday, that bit more approachable, relaxed. It was a car you would quite happily jump in and drive to a circuit on the continent somewhere in more relaxed fashion than the other two, but you would have a lot more fun in the other two when you got there. It still feels to me that there is some scope within the GT4 for something more. Whereas Porsche is ready to get everything it can out of the 911, it feels like it's still holding something back in the Cayman. A Cayman GT4 RS would be utterly heavenly, I strongly suspect. What do Porsche GT cars have in common? They've all got a focused interior with a brilliant driving position. I mean, the driving position is consistently fabulous through all of them. When they do have a manual gearbox, it's short of throw and the engine is responsive. The pedal weights are all really set up for driving enjoyment by people who just enjoy the sheer process of driving themselves. The steering is of varying weights. This is about the same sort of speed and weight as that GT3 RS, but it's a little bit more relaxed than the GT2 RS, but they all have a real consistent build-up of weight and feel of centre. And they all just have a chassis you can just really play around with. And I know it's childish, and I know it's puerile. When you get a car that's got this brilliant chassis, why do you just want to drive it beyond its limit of adhesion. I don't know where the fun in that is. It doesn't make any sense to me in the same way that it doesn't make any sense to my mum. I just like doing it. And a lot of ride and handling engineers like doing it too. A lot of people who like cars like doing it. And when you get a car that is good at it, beyond its limit, it, when it's rewarding beyond the limits of grip, they also tend to be really well sorted below the limits of grip. That's all I can tell you from a purely scientific basis, from a purely objective basis. A car that's good to slide around in is usually pretty good the rest of the time as well. They tend to be the best engineered cars on the planet and GT Porsches, RS or not RS, two, three or four are among them. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this, check out our McLaren Megatest, an F1, P1 and Senna on the same track at the same time. And if you like that, give us a thumbs up, subscribe and even turn on post notifications.